So we have a range of conservative treatments. This is um, a few of them, compression, manual lymphatic drainage, massage, um, laser exercise. I don't, has PhysioTouch come to the US? Um, it's negative pressure, acupuncture, kinesio taping. There's a lot of things out there. So I thought I'd start with compression. And obviously, there's a variety of ways that you can apply it. There's the compression garments, short stretch bandaging, um, now fair, different sort of wraps, particularly useful with palliative care patients that are having lymphedema, Job's pumps, um, and so on and so forth. The evidence is pretty clear that reduction, if you want to reduce the limb, you use um, bandaging, short stretch bandaging, that it can get the limb down really nicely. Um, for maintenance, once you have it, you ha can use compression garments. And so th what the guidelines tell us is that if you have um, early or mild lymphedema, you use low pressures, moderate to severe lymphedema, a um, bit higher, and then for the severe complex cases, you can go higher still. The question is, are these the correct pressures? Are we doing the best by our patients? So I'm gonna challenge you. Um, we've run clinical, um, we, we've run focus groups with clinicians. It was one of the studies done by one of our students to see what do clinicians do for patients. And there was complete lack of agreement. We have the guidelines, they're not being implemented. So we have some um, therapists that will use lightweight compression for mild lymphedema. We have others who at the first sign of lymphedema will start putting lots of pressure on. How much pressure? Do you just do um, wrist to axilla? Or do you include the hand? Do you use double over the wrist? There's a lot of different, there's a lot of variability in what goes on, particularly in that first year. We look at what patients perceive they've been instructed by their clinicians on how to use, when to use the garments. We use the um, classification of severity by um, the Validate Scale um, Norman developed that mild, um, it's only observable to you. Moderate, people close to you can see that you have it. Your therapist would recognize it right away. Severe, anyone on the street would recognize you've got something wrong with your limb. To, um, given that these were done um, online, these questionnaires. So it's about 180 women here that have reported what their clinicians have told you. And there's variability um, what they're doing. For example, for um, mild severity, some women are told only use it during risky business, where um, that's also what's being told for moderate severity. For women with mild, they're being told to wear it all the time, day and night. What's the right answer? We don't know. What compression is the right compression? This was a really interesting study done by Vignes um, in 2011 is the first one that's actually looked at how much pressure is being applied and what happens to change in volume. What they found was that less pressure resulted in greater volume. The nice thing about this study is that they had moderate severity lymphedema, that the participants had to have um, 20 to 40 percent um, at least 20% interlimb difference. So we're talking about major um, moderate to severe lymphedema. So low pressure, you got a change in volume within two hours, and it was still there 24 hours later. With the higher pressures, nothing occurred within the first two hours, and there was some not quite as much as what occurred with, low, with the lower pressure. So what do, how much pressure do we give? Should we be giving? The, it was, um, the other thing to note is the, we are supposedly giving um, class two compression garments to our patients with moderate severity lymphedema. We're quite measuring them um, similar to the device that um, <laughs> Professor Bronson's used for one of his study. Um, pilot sensors to quantify 
the volume. What we're finding is it's a dog's breakfast with how much pressure is actually being applied. Um, so theoretically, these are all getting similar pressures, um, but you can see the mean pressure was 16.2 in the forearm, but could range from 7 to 28 millimeters of pressure, right up to um, in the upper arm, theoretically, it ranged from 11 to 24 not anywhere near what we're um, theoretically giving these women. It wasn't related to the age of the garment. Some of these women had the garment for six months and they were actually applying the correct pressure. Others had actually recently got new garments and they were either over applying too much pressure or not sufficient, even though it was the same person doing all the skilled measurements. So, the pressures that we think we're getting, giving probably aren't that anyways. So the other issue that comes into um, treatment is compliance. Um, as part of one of our surveys of 178 women um, around compression, it was asked how much, how compliant they were with the instructions. And it was roughly 70% um, women were compliant. That, so yeah, I can follow it a bit, but not totally. And so of interest was a study done here in the US by Brown over from Katie Schmidt's PAL study. And um, it was found that of the women that were, had been prescribed compression garments, 70%, less than 75% were compliant. Are they right? Do they actually need the compression? Are they better informed than us as clinicians who are saying, well, you have to wear it all waking hours or both day and night, whatever. Um, so there's a number of issues. It's, we know it's effective, but the question is, can we do better with compression? So what level of compression is needed for what level of swelling? We're now getting more sophisticated. We saw this imaging studies that were occurring. The same volume doesn't actually equal the same amount of underlying changes that are going. We need to be better informed about that. Use some of the other um, clinical tools that we have at our fingertip and start a systematic approach to this. Um, extent of compression. How much compression do we really need? Um, this idea that if you get any worse than you add more compression, more, more, is that right? Um, I have a PhD student that's challenging that. She lives in regional New South Wales and it goes up to 40 degrees Celsius in the summer. They just will not tolerate compression garments. So she started experimenting. If the lymphedema is in the hand or the forearm, she'll take it up to the elbow. They wear it at night, not the daytime. It's sufficient to maintain compression. Um, again, are we too adherent to what we're being told to do without challenging the system? And again, um, duration, how much? So the next thing to consider is addition of treatment to compression. And again, I'm glad that Professor Bronson led the way, the charge this morning on this topic. We did a um, single session study, it was a master student of mine, that looked at the effect of massage on um, upper limb lymphedema. And this was a single session of <coughs> massage that the person came in, they were quiet for half an hour, had the full lymphedema massage, and then half the women were randomized to compression, half not. Um, one of the easier studies to recruit for, particularly the control women, happy to sign up for massage. Um, you can see here is the pre-massage -ar arm volume, post-arm massage and rest, and there's the control. The line identity is here. Basically, there was no change. If anything, the, control, the women, the controls that had had no lymphedema were slightly more responsive to massage than the lymphedema patients. Moving on, we saw the study come out from Margie McNeely um, and her group back in 2004, looking at four weeks of um, short stretch bandaging with um, plus or minus massage. Um, and so here we can see the data, baseline post, compression plus um, 
MLD are red, and compression bandaging only are blue. They're overlapping. If we look at the difference, the change in volume, you see you get great response. Um, and I want to draw your attention. We can do a lot of things with numbers. And sometimes we try to manipulate numbers to, be, to make us, to show what we hypothesize. And I think we have to be very careful about that. With this study, the absolute difference between the two groups was 14 mils reduction in favor of compression bandage alone. If you look at the um, relative difference, however, so you're starting to play with percentages and things like that, it showed a 7.5% um, change in favor of the MLD plus compression. You need to be careful what, really understand what your data is saying. Regardless, a month of massage, that would be in Australia about $150 a session, um, three times a week potentially for four weeks. It's an awful lot of money for that 15 mil difference, if that's, um, or 7% difference, if that's what you're gaining. There is this study that um, also showed that um, it was a, um, systematic review that they're coming out now quite commonly showing in fact um, that the addition of compression did not add significant amount of um, reduction in volume and there's an anomaly here by Sitsia if you go to their actual study it's again it's playing with percentages on top of percentages on top of percentages so you can't work out what the actual real value of real change is um, and again, the sample size here is 117 to 120. The ESO systematic review came out last year, and you're looking at a 3% difference in favor of MLD. Again, it's a very small percentage. You take that on board when you look at this large trial that was published in um, Oh, Journal of Clinical Oncology. Um, this was an RCT where they recruited women um, at baseline. They were randomized to compression garment and CDT followed for the whole year. And you can see down here, there's no difference between groups. The adding massage did not reduce the volume um, above that that you could exceed, um, obtain with compression garments in this case only. So, if you think, I know I heard people muttering as they're leaving, oh, I really believe in CDT. It's not a religion, it's a treatment. <laughs> we don't want belief. But if it's effective, for whom is it effective? It would appear that you have to have some functioning lymphatics for it to be effective. If that's the case, how much volume are you going to actually reduce? If your goal is to reduce this to reduce volume, and it's really, you gotta be clear in your head, what is the purpose of your treatment? Volume, you're not gaining. Use short stretch bandages, it's much more efficient, more cost of benefit for the patient. Um, you can use, if you're focused on the BIS, we have women with really big arms that do have high BIS, perhaps massage in those instances, we'll be doing it. We need a structured approach. We need to really start unpacking if it is effective for whom. Um, thing. So there's a few other um, different modalities out there. Laser, this is again, this is very popular in Australia. They led the charge with it. Um, I didn't label this one, not surprising that the bottom ones of each of these pairs are the women that have received laser. Um, there seems to be some efficacy with that, also shown with laser therapy. The research has focused on limb volume. Um, we do need, I'll say it again, we do need a better um, tool for measuring tone because the other um, report that often occurs, it's really good at softening the skins, um, but we don't know how to quantify that one. Um, I think Taiwan group had a tonometer they were using. The ones that have been in Australia have been very unreliable, so not worth it. So we have that. 
Kinesiotyping, um, unfortunately, these were not the best studies that were conducted. They're not used the way that um, it, you'd actually, the studies were not designed to demonstrate whether it's effective the way it's actually used clinically. We need to redo the studies to see does it have a role, particularly in hand edema for patients. And I just happen to have a new student starting next year to address that one. Um, and then this is another one that we've got a new PhD student starting to look at. It's the um, newest toy on the block, um, Physio Touch. It's negative. So everything we're doing is about compression. Physio Touch is negative. It's suction. It's pulling the re um, opening up with vibration. And we don't, um, certainly the, the company's taken it around and let the clinicians try it and yep, it's great, does amazing things. There's still no good quality trials on this. So they've lent us one. Um, we're going to try it, RCT. Um, they have no say in what the outcomes would be, um, which is always important if you're going to use some equipment um, to determine it. Again, anecdotally, it appears to be quite good for breaking those um, thick and collagenous bonds to help soften it. The interesting thing that happens when you do that is, for example, your BIS will increase. The fluids have increased, released, um, broken the bonds, um, softened it, so you'll get an elevated BIS, which will then go down quickly. The last thing to talk about, which um, I hope that everyone still uses, is exercise. Cellulitis is a really big problem um, for some patients. And whilst exercise has not been shown to reduce volume, it did have good, did um, demonstrate good outcomes in reduced number of infections, et cetera. And this was the trial run by Katie Schmitz and her colleagues here in the US. Um, highly impressive to get a New England Journal of Medicine for a physio um, exercise type of intervention. And so she used, um, recruited 141 women with breast cancer, in randomized to exercise, no exercise, progressive resistance training, and women were progressed. Um, this isn't light breathing exercises. This was standard upper limb, lower limb resistance training. Um, progressed, if there was a little bit of an exacerbation in measurements, dropped the weight back, but didn't saw, um, settle, stopped it, and then started again. And so there was, as I said, didn't really affect the volume, but what it did do was prevent exacerbations and infections. So the last thing I want to end on is I gave the talk earlier about measurement really think about what we're treating. Are you treating the fluid or are you treating other aspects, the reducing of the infections, whatever? You can't simply go by volume and think small arm equals mostly fluid, big arm is fat. Um, certainly from our studies in MRI and DEXA, we've seen early changes of adipose tissue very early. We've seen dermal backflow significant of um, quite late, um, significant changes associated with lymphedema in arms that are not very different in size. Likewise, we've seen quite big arms, I was shown earlier this morning, where there's a lot of fluid um, in the arm, even though there's also a lot of fat. You need to know what you're treating and choose the right modality and the right approach for that. Um, we're starting to play around with um, diffusion weighted imaging to identify fluids. And so that yellow here is this limb where you can see the honeycombing um, is picks up the unattached fluids in there. <laughs>